Ninth Story Studios, giving story a voice. You're listening to the Wicked Library. <laughs> Hello, and happy Halloween. Welcome to episode number 1016 of the Wicked Library. I'm Daniel Foytek, and I'm happy you've chosen to join us for this year's annual Halloween episode. A big thank you to those who took the time to rate us five stars and write a short review for us on iTunes. It helps others find the show, and your librarian is always delighted when more listeners find their way into his lair. Speaking of the librarian, he told me that if you haven't already you had better buy his anthology, 13 Wicked Tales. Now, few things are more frustrating than hearing about that other holiday when we haven't even finished eating our Halloween treats. So, all I'll say is this. If you need an excuse to bring terror into your home or gift nightmares to a friend or enemy, there is a day coming soon where your gift won't be at all suspicious to the recipient. Find our anthology on Amazon in print and Kindle by going to thewickedlibrary.com forward slash read. Also, a big thank you to those who are supporting the show. We had several new supporters sign up on Patreon, and we all deeply thank you. Without you, this show would not be possible. On behalf of our authors and everyone else involved in making the show, a sincere thank you for your support of this show and, of course, of independent horror fiction. If you're not yet supporting the show, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash wicked library. And now, to bring a little extra wicked to your holiday celebration, your librarian. Well, hello, kiddies. Welcome to Halloween at the Wicked Library. It's been quite a terrifying year, and I'm not even talking about the show. <laughs> As the year winds down, crawling into the inevitable, let's take solace in that today it's totally acceptable to be terrified. For everyone else. We, dear listeners, celebrate that on the daily. It's always Halloween in our hearts, after all. Little dark things as they are. <laughs> they may be small and dark, but they are full, aren't they? <laughs> we have three tales for you this year. Our old friends Gary Bronbeck, Nelson Piles, and Lydia Peaver have some unnerving little tales for you all. Narrated by Erica Sanderson, Cynthia Loman in Piles himself. Buckle yourselves in. Feel free to keep your mask on. It will help keep the screaming at a manageable level. <laughs> Happy Halloween, kiddies. <laughs> Ah, so you've come in search of a story, have you? Well, you've come to the right place. My private collection of dark tomes are hungry for your fear, filled with stories that are sure to terrify, disturb, and delight. Be warned, though, these tales are not for sensitive listeners. You're going to hear things that will upset and quite possibly offend. Ah, here's a good one. Follow me now and we'll enjoy this tale together. It's story time at the Wicked Library. <laughs> First up, we have Light on Broken Glass by Gary A. Bronbeck, told by Nelson W. Piles and scored by Nico Viteze of We Talk of Dreams. The people who have adored me, there have not been very many, but there have been a few, have always insisted on living on long after I have ceased to care for them, or they to care for me. Oscar Wilde, The Picture of Dorian Gray 
Don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Anton Chekhov The thing is, I never stopped missing her. Even when she made it clear at the divorce hearing that she wanted no contact with or from me until I found my soul again, even though I knew that we'd never have the chance of even being just friends, even though I kept hoping that the thought of me and our marriage never crossed her mind again so she'd know some kind of happiness. I I missed her every goddamn day. And now she's gone and everything's following after her and I... Jesus, I'm scared. Can, can I get one of those cigarettes? Thank you. Man, that tastes good. I suppose I ought to be grateful she didn't smoke, too, or else you would have offered me was an empty hand. Please don't look at me that way. I know how it sounds, and I also know that you're the third. N- no, wait. Make that the fourth detective to come in here and talk to me. I- I'm surprised it took this long to send in a female detective, though. I mean, what's the idea that if you flash enough new faces my way, eventually I'm going to change the story? And why you? Did one of the higher-ups determine that I'm more likely to make a slip if they sent in a skirt to batter sparkly eyes at me? I'm, I'm sorry, that, that was rude. I didn't mean to offend you, honestly. Despite what you may think, I do respect women, Detective Manning. But I didn't always. Hell, at one point in my life, I was a real hound. You know the type, the kind of guy that lives by the rule of the four Fs. Find him, feed him, fuck him, and forget him. Yeah, I was a sexist ass, but Laura, my ex-wife, she cured me of that. She made me understand what a pig I'd been, and she didn't do it by trying to make me feel guilty. She did it by... Hell, what's it matter now? Come again? Do I find it easier to talk to women? I I don't know. I, Yeah, I suppose I do. Since we're being so honest and open and forgiving and all that, mind telling me how big of an audience we got watching us from behind the mirror? No, it doesn't matter. I'm just curious, that's all. (laughs) Wow, that many? Hello, folks. What? Noticed that, did you? Nope. (laughs) No one's asked me about how it all started, which is probably why nothing I've said so far makes much sense. You're the first one. Look, I I didn't mean to scare all those people. I, I only pulled out the gun because I wanted someone to prove to me that the fucking McDonald's was still there. I've been trying for days to get someone to prove things like that to me, and the gun seemed to be the best way to get people's attention, that's all. Damn thing wasn't even loaded, by the way. Of course, you know that. I swear to you, I never would have hurt anyone. I didn't idolize that I'm going to hunt humans guy who shot up that Mickey D's back in 84. I know, I'm avoiding your question. I recognize my voice, but you have to understand. I can't just tell you about how it started without getting into details that don't seem like much taken by themselves but that if you look at them as part of a whole... Okay, the McDonald's. That particular McDonald's. The one where you arrested me, it's the same one that Laura and I always went to for Sunday morning breakfast. It was the one closest to her old apartment. See, when we were dating, when we were still in that giddy getting to know all about you phase, we always went out... On Saturday, we'd start with some lunch, then some shopping, clothes stores, bookstores, record stores. This was back when they still manufactured records and not CDs. Then we'd hit a movie, go out for a late dinner, and always wind up back at her place where we would spend the whole night just talking. Then one of us would look at the clock and see that it was like 6.45 in the morning. And then we'd hit that McDonald's for breakfast before I went back to my place and Laura went home. Those Sunday breakfasts, those were, those were one of our things, you know? Silly as it sounds, we thought of that Mickey D's as our Mickey D's. Every Sunday morning after breakfast, I'd kiss her goodbye in the parking lot and we'd hold each other longer and longer each time until she finally looked at me one morning and said, This is stupid. Come back home with me. 
Even after we were married, we always went to that McDonald's. Look me in the eyes, Detective Manning. Thank you. I demanded a polygraph test earlier, and by now, my guess is that the results showed I wasn't lying. I am telling you, my hand to God, that I am telling you that that McDonald's isn't there now. When I got the word ten days ago that Laura had died, I couldn't think, I couldn't feel, I couldn't function. So I did the only thing I could think to do, and that was to sit up crying all night Saturday night and go to that McDonald's on Sunday morning to have breakfast in her memory. I know how pathetic that sounds, believe me. But I was so goddamn sick right down to my bones that it was all I could think to do. And there I am, turning the corner, expecting to see those golden arches rising out of the dark, and I see nothing. Maybe the sign's just out, I think, and I drive on up, and you know what I see? I see an asphalt parking lot filled with cars. I see people getting out of those cars, and I see the same people walking toward the center of the lot where no building stands. No golden arches, no statue of Ronald McDonald, the Hamburglar, or the creepy-ass Mary McCheese, and definitely no building. There's just this empty space. Christ, there's not even any asphalt where the building should be. Just this hole that looks like it bottoms out into eternity. But I sit there and I watch these people get out of their cars and walk across the lot and reach out and open a door that as far as I can see doesn't exist. And then walk into a building that isn't there. They just vanish. Poof! Like that. Half an hour I sat there Watching people disappear, then reappear. I watched cars pull up next to a drive-up window that wasn't there and then watched as part of an arm came out of the ether, handing them their bags of food. I drove back to my place, took a couple of sleeping pills. Yes, I've got a prescription. I haven't slept worth a shit since the divorce three years ago, so I take a couple of these things and I collapse. When I got up later, I kept telling myself it was just the shock of hearing about Laura's death. God, remember the day of the divorce. When I watched her walk out of the courthouse without giving me so much as a backward glance, I remember thinking, I won't be there for her when she dies. That was another one of our things, knowing that we'd have someone who loved us there to hold our hand when we died, someone we'd shared a lifetime with, who knew everything about us, who could read even the most subtle signal and know exactly, precisely, what all was connected to it, to hold that hand and look one last time into their eyes and know that all you did, all you believed in and hoped for and treasured, all of it meant something. Because this person holding your hand, they would carry you with them always until it was time to pass your memory on to someone else safekeeping before they had to say goodbye. Shit. Listen to me, will you? Now I get romantic and sentimental. It's almost funny. But when you break up with someone, I'm guessing you've broken up with at least a couple of guys in your time. When you make the break, your first reaction is always to hide all the evidence that the relationship ever happened. You, You put away or throw away pictures, birthday cards, letters, things like that. Then maybe you toss out gifts they gave to you, clear their stuff from your closet or bathroom. You know, the physical stuff. Makes it easier to not look around and see a direct number of them and what they meant to you. You think that takes care of it. You think those are all the details, the little things that might sneak up on you remind you of how much it fucking hurts to not be with them anymore. But those aren't the details. They're just the glint of light on broken glass because the details you can't touch because you can't touch them. You can't hide them. You can't hide the coo of a morning dove that always reminds you of the way they smile in the morning when they heard the same sound. You can't hide the smell of freshly mown grass that they always enjoyed, or the sound of a train's horn sounding late at night in the distance that was their favorite sound in the world, and you sure as hell can't hide 
the way autumn twilight filters down through the changing leaves. Their favorite time of day during their favorite time of the year. But you know what? That doesn't mean they can't be taken away from you. Okay, then. Started the day before I got the news about Laura. I was I was out of that used book and CD store downtown. Oh, oh, you know it? Neat place, isn't it? Anyway, I'm in there and I'm going through the books and the CDs and the guy working the counter, he's got a Grand Funk CD playing the We're an American Band album. Not my favorite, but even second-rate funk beats most of the stuff clogging up the airways these days. You know Grand Funk? <laughs> that surprises me. You don't look old enough to be into anything older than Pearl Jam or Eminem. Huh. It's kind of cool being surprised like that. So, I'm listening to the music, and it occurs to me that I haven't heard I'm Your Captain for a while, and all of a sudden I really want to hear it. So I flip through the CD bin until I find a copy of the album, and I take it over to the area that they've got set up where you can listen to a few tracks from a CD before deciding whether or not you, you want to buy it. I pop in the CD and skip ahead to the seventh track that's supposed to be I'm Your Captain. And all I hear is silence. I check to make sure the disc is playing and according to the track time elapsed, read out the songs playing, but I'm not hearing it. I skip back a couple of tracks and it turns out every other song on the CD plays loud and clear, but I'm Your Captain won't play for some reason. I tell the guy at the counter about it. He comes over, takes a listen, and tells me that it's playing just fine. Hands me the headphones and walks away. I listen again. Nothing. I stop this one guy and ask him if this sounds funny to him. He gives me a weird look, but he takes the headphones and listens, and he says it sounds fine to him. I buy the CD anyway and a bunch of books, and I start driving home. All the way there, I'm scanning through my presets on the radio. Surprise, surprise, they're old, old fart classic radio stations, hoping that maybe one of them will be playing I'm Your Captain. No luck. I don't know why, but suddenly, there is nothing I want more in the world than to hear that song. I've owned that album on real to real 8-track vinyl cassette and CD. I'll bet I've listened to that song hundreds of times throughout my life. But right then, that afternoon, I was obsessed with hearing it. I get home and pop in the CD and... No song. Just silence. I was getting ready to pop it out when I noticed how deep the silence was. I I don't know if this is going to make sense, but it wasn't just silence. It wasn't just the absence of music or sound. It was like I was listening to the direct opposite of music and sound. Something so deeply empty that silence doesn't even begin to cover it. I switched over to the turntable and pulled out the vinyl album and set the needle and tone arm onto the third track on the second side. Kind of hard to miss since it runs ten minutes and takes up almost half the side. There it is. I can see the grooves. I can hear the needle touch down and connect. And there's nothing. I stood there and watched the fucking needle play halfway through the song and all I'm getting from the speakers is the same damned vast emptiness. I did the experiment again. I picked up the needle and put it on a different track. And the two other songs on the side played loud and clear, but I'm Your Captain just wasn't there. And it wasn't until I was putting the record back in the sleeve that I remember how much Laura hated that song. I mean, really, truly, deeply hated it. And I remembered how... When she'd first told me that she was filing for divorce, we'd gotten into an argument over who was going to get what, and I don't remember all the specifics. But somewhere in that marathon fight, God, it was ugly, we started needling each other. I was going to keep this thing I'd gotten for her last birthday. She was going to take back that anniversary present. Pretty hurtful, childish stuff. Shit that diminishes you, even though you don't know it at the time. And I remembered that when we got down to the records, the first album she pulled out to keep for herself was the Closer to Home album. What the fuck do you want that for? I yelled at her. You hate them. You especially hate I'm Your Captain. Yeah, she said back to me. I do hate that song, but you love it. And maybe having this taken away from you will give you some idea of what you've taken away from me 
and how much it hurts. The thing is, it it didn't matter that she hated it and I loved it. She loved me, so it's like our feelings for that song made that song ours in a weird kind of way. Do you understand what I mean? But here's another thing. You know how when you listen to a favorite song over and over throughout your life, you've come to memorize it? So that even if you're not listening to it, no radio station is playing it. All you have to do is pull it out of your memory and you can listen to it in your head from beginning to end. I couldn't do that. I must have stood there in the middle of my living room for 20 minutes trying to pull I'm your captain from my memory and hear it in my head, but it wasn't there anymore. Are you getting this, Detective Manning? It was gone. No music, no lyrics. I couldn't even find the opening chord. Not only was the song no longer part of my external word, it had been expunged from my memory as well. I think that's when it actually started. I I just didn't know it, or maybe I did know it, but couldn't wrap my brain around it. All I knew was that I needed to get back out into the world and make sure the world was still there. Decided to go to a movie, right? Why not? It was Friday. I didn't have anything else to do, and I figured being around other people might help me calm down and get a little perspective, figure things out. So I decided to go see the new Richard Morse movie, right? Morse was Laura's and my favorite actor. We'd see anything he was in, even if he was just playing a supporting role in some potboiler action flick. I sat in that theater for two hours watching this movie that he was supposed to be starring in, and he never fucking showed up. The damn thing made no sense to me. All these people talking to someone who wasn't there and listening to the same someone who's not there say things in response long tracking shots with nobody in the frame people getting hit by a phantom it couldn't have made less sense if i'd been stoned after it was over and everyone was leaving i heard people talking about how good morris had been in the movie how they thought he should finally get an oscar how much better he kept getting with every performance Now I'm getting scared, right? I try to be casual when I walk up to this one group of people and ask them what they thought. And they're telling me, and I try to be nonchalant when I finally ask, so who did Morse play? And they all look at me like I must be drunk or something. And I say, seriously, maybe I missed something, but I don't remember seeing Morse anywhere in that movie. One guy tells me to fuck off and leave him alone. I go out and sit in my car and I try thinking back to other Morris movies that Laura and I have seen. And for the life of me, I I can't remember his voice, his face, or any of the characters he's played. Nothing. I get home and go right to the DVD cabinet, pull out half a dozen Richard Morris movies. I go through them one by one and the man, he, he isn't in any of them. Same thing as before, other actors talking to or listening to a man who isn't there, and me, I can't remember him. He's gone. Just like, I'm your captain. No more. I sat there in my living room after that, just trying to remember anything like that. Anything that Laura and I had shared, had loved or liked or admired together, and I can't remember any of them don't remember falling asleep. What I do remember is someone pounding on my front door at nine on Saturday morning. It's Laura's brother. This is a guy I haven't seen in almost five years. He and Laura didn't get along all that well, so we only saw him on holidays with the rest of the family. I open the door and have just enough time to register that he's been crying before he lands the first punch. Next thing I know, I'm on the floor and he's kneeling on top of me, pounding the shit out of me, screaming about how I ruined her life and broke her heart and betrayed her and made her feel used and worthless and stupid. He broke down and eventually told me that she died the day before at 3.30 in the afternoon. Then he beat the shit out of me again and left. Yeah, that's why the bruises and bandages. I didn't call the cops and press charges because I deserved it. 
I deserved to have the living shit beaten out of me. I pissed all over a 14-year marriage by having an affair behind her back. It destroyed her when she found out about it. What? Oh, uh, breast cancer. She'd been getting treated for it for a while, and her third round of treatments, as it turned out. I guess the first time it was in the very early stages and they thought they'd taken care of it with the radiation treatments. The second time, she lost her right breast. Last time, she lost the left one, but it turns out it had spread and metastasized her liver, her lungs, her brain. Cancer ran in the women in her family. For four years, she'd been fighting it. When I was putting myself back together, two things registered. She'd been fighting the cancer for four years. During the year before the divorce hearing, she'd known she was sick. She'd known that day in court, and she didn't tell me. She had dozens of opportunities to tell me, and she didn't. God. How I must have hurt her. I mean, I I knew that I'd hurt her, that I'd broken her heart, but until that moment... I didn't let myself realize just how deep and permanent that pain and humiliation must have been for her. It also meant that she'd she'd found out about it while I was screwing around on her. My, My wife was sick with cancer and I was fucking someone else behind her back. There's there's not gonna be a deep enough pit in hell for me. I'm uh I'm not with the quote-unquote other woman anymore. We lived together for a year after the divorce, but it didn't last. The two years we were sneaking around, those were hot because it was all so forbidden and so dangerous. Scumbag I was. What an idiot. The other thing I realized... Hmm. Think about it, Detective Manning. You're a, you're a bright person. Laura died... At 3.30 Friday afternoon. Do you know where I was and what I was doing at 3.30 Friday afternoon? That's right. Standing in the middle of that goddamn store trying to figure out why I'm your captain wasn't playing. So I sat in my room crying until Sunday morning when I decided to honor her memory with a breakfast at McDonald's that turned out to be... Not there anymore. At least not for me. It got worse in a hurry after that. There's there's a tree in the park where she and I used to go for picnics, right next to the duck pond. The tree was gone, but its shade was still there. People looked at me like I was crazy when I started asking about it. Landmarks that we used to visit aren't there anymore, even though I can see people disappearing into them and coming out again. Mutual friends that we had didn't know who the hell I was. Valerie, the girl who introduced us, threatened me with a stun gun when I confronted her. She swore up and down that she had no idea who I was, but even while she was screaming at me, I could see i could see that there was some part of her that knows she ought to recognize me, but she doesn't. I'm a stranger. Look, do you really want a list of all the places and things and people I went looking for? None of the external word that she and I shared together is there anymore. Not for me. And now that physical stuff is gone, that only leaves the memories. Mine and everyone else's who knew us when we were together. Hell yes, I panicked. Why do you think I wound up holding those people at gunpoint in the Mickey D's parking lot? Everything around me was disappearing left and right. The only reason nothing in my apartment vanished is because it's all stuff I got after the divorce. It's all stuff I bought because it didn't remind me of her, of us, of what we had. No, no, please, don't leave just yet. I need I, I need to tell you something, okay? I've been thinking about this a lot the last few days, and I think I know what's happened. It was... It was at the divorce hearing, right? When she told me that I could contact her again when I found my soul. She knew something then that I was too stupid to realize. I mean, I never really bought into all that romantic soulmate stuff, but I think that's what happened. 
She was my soulmate. We'd been together so long, had known each other so intimately that when we became more than just a married couple, who knew each other's habits and quirks? Our souls, they... They intertwined so deeply that they became one thing, right? I mean, that's what's supposed to happen when two people fall in love and then marry. They become one. And when Laura died, because she was a better person than I ever was, because her part of our soul was pure and true and honest, it it absorbed mine and took it with her. That's why it's all slipping away from me. Don't have a soul left to find. Please don't leave Detective Manning. L- look in the mirror and tell me what you see. Uh huh. Y- you know what I see? I see you just fine, and I see the clothes I'm in wearing clear as day. But look at look at me. These hands, this head, they're a fucking blur to me. Like in photos where someone turns their head just as the picture is taken, and it's all just a smudge. That's all I see, and every minute, it keeps getting less. Please don't leave, Detective, because if you do, then you won't be looking at me anymore, and eventually all those people behind the mirror, they're going to leave. Sure, they might leave one person there to keep an eye on me, but eventually that person's going to look at the clock, or their feet, or rub their eyes, and then I'll be gone As long as someone is looking at me, as long as they acknowledge my existence, I'll still be here. But the minute no one's looking at me, I'm gone. Okay, you promise? Someone will keep watching me. Okay, good. It's it's funny when you think about it, you know? I mean, mean, here I was. I, I had everything in my life that made it worthwhile that I didn't treasure like I should have. She knew, Laura knew, that we'd always be together, that we were meant to be as one. So now, we'll be that way. Huh? Oh, because I know that whoever is left is going to look away or blink and that'll be it. Maybe, maybe it's better this way. Maybe her love for me will save me from hell. I, I don't know. I just hope she forgives me when I see her again. She was always forgiving me when I screwed up. So, so goodbye, Detective Manning. That... Thank you for listening to me. Laura would have liked you. She, Laura liked everyone. She'd sometimes go out of her way to find something to like about someone. I used to kid her about that big time. What, what's that sound, sound from behind the mirror? Jesus, it sounds like everyone is leaving. Please, hey, please don't go. Please don't look away. Not now, not just yet. I'm not quite ready to... Where do you think you're going? There's more story to come! <laughs> Don't you want us to keep the lights on? <laughs> Up next, it's Erica Sanderson, telling a tale by our very own Nelson W. Piles, accompanied by a score by Nico Viteze of We Talk of Dreams. Listen along now to the dinner conversation. What's that? Oh, sure, here's the gravy. Yeah, my mind has been wandering a lot lately since Sal passed away. Oh, thank you. But you don't have to keep offering your sympathies, Jill. I appreciate it. I also appreciate you coming to have dinner tonight. It gets awful lonely around here these days. I know... It's been a long week, hasn't it? It's been hardest at night when I'm trying to go to sleep. I reach for him, you know. Absent-mindedly, of course. A habit. And the reaction is still jarring. There's just a pillow there now. No, Sal. Just his pillow. I'd been thinking about getting a new bed. Smaller, since it's just me now. But not yet. The bed still smells like him. And it's comforting, as it is depressing. Yes, the turkey is pretty juicy, isn't it? Slow roasting is the key. And that turkey bag is great. Sal found that. He almost always made the turkey round here. 
about the only thing he could cook. Tja, well, he wasn't a good cook otherwise. If it was up to him, we would have starved to death. Yes. Yes, it was a terrible way to go. No. No, I don't mind talking about it. Haven't really talked about it with anyone besides the police. Might do me some good, actually. Yes, the police. They thought I might have pushed them down the cellar steps. Yes, I know. Little old me, right? Just walking up behind him and pushing him down there. I know. Insane. Oh, yes. The stuffing is an old recipe from Sal's mum. It's pretty tasty, but I've always preferred mashed potatoes myself. Sal hated them. Had to learn how to make the stuffing to the letter of his mom's if he can believe such a thing. And oh, his mother. Dear God, what a lousy human being. Oh. Just sure you can have more potatoes. I have a lot, believe me. Do you know, that was the last thing Sal and I argued about that night. His mother. She's been dead for almost 20 years and he still wouldn't admit that she was, above all else, a selfish you-know-what. She used to drive me crazy. Especially near the end of her life, God rest her soul. Sal had a propensity to behave a lot like her. I mean, just as ugly as she was, sometimes if not uglier. She had a mean streak a mile wide. And sometimes, Mama's boy would show that side too. He sure did the night he died. More wine? Oh, I'd love some. Although, I'd better slow it down a bit. I'm already a little tipsy. Anywho, where was I? Ah, the night Sal died. Well, I had just cleared up after dinner. Made a wonderful Irish stew, which he normally loves. I mean, loved. But that night, he just wasn't in a good mood. He was downright mean. He told this awful joke that really made me angry. What was it? Do you really want to hear it? Okay. He said, How many potatoes does it take to kill the Irish? He knows I don't like ethnic jokes, especially about the Irish, because I am Irish. But this time I let him do a stupid joke. So I bit, and I said, How many? None, he said, and he laughed himself hoarse. Well, you can imagine my disgust. What an awful thing to joke about. And I told him so. He just laughed at me, and said that the Irish were a weak people, and pushed away from the table. I finished cleaning up the kitchen, but I was furious. How dare he say something like that, even though I knew he was kidding. But the weak people thing was totally his mother's influence. Oh, Jill, the things that woman would say to me because I was Irish and a ginger. She was awful. Do you know Sal never defended me? As affectionate as he was and could be, he never once stood up to her for me. I would be in tears for hours. He'd just shrug and say, Ah, she's an old woman, just ignore her. But I couldn't. Not even once could I just ignore her. I'd always get pulled into an argument with her, and Sal would try to break it up, try to smooth things over, and sometimes it would work and I'd apologise to the old buzzard. But other times I wouldn't, and Sal would yell at me the whole way home, saying I was being a bad wife and I should respect his mother, blah, blah, blah. Do you remember how he was, Jill? Dog with a bone. But he couldn't just defend me once, could he? Even after she'd been dead for so long, just couldn't do me the courtesy. So he went into the living room to watch the news while I did the dishes. The more I washed, the angrier I got, and I decided that night that he was going to get a piece of my mind. Yes, I have plenty of mashed potatoes. Please help yourself. I'm so glad you like them. Anyway, I walked into the living room and I coughed to get his attention. He didn't move or say a word. So I coughed again. He said, What? Already? I tore into him about his little joke. About his cracks, about the Irish being weak. About how much like his mother he'd become. And he just sat there staring at me. I must have gone on for about ten minutes and he just stared at me. When I got done, I stood there. I had never once talked to him like that before and it felt good. Don't get me wrong, I loved Sal. I mean, I loved Sal. Do you know what I mean? What did he say? He said... After all that ranting I had done, that I had just proved that his mother was right. My jaw dropped, and he went back to watch the news. I couldn't believe my ears. I must have stood there for a long time, because he finally said, 
If you're going to stand there, you can at least shut your mouth. You're breathing all heavy and I can't hear the news. Isn't that just an awful thing to say? What did I do? I just stormed off, for one thing. Back into the kitchen, of course. My place, where I should have stayed, according to him. He would say that sometimes. That my place was there in the kitchen since I couldn't have children. Or so he liked to tell folks. Hugh didn't know. Oh, it was a total scandal, according to his mother. He told everyone that the doctor said I was unable to have children. That it was a shame and all that. His mother said he should never have married me. That I should have told him that I couldn't have kids to save him the trouble of marrying me. To know? Awful, right? Except it wasn't me. It was him. He was sterile. He was so embarrassed and he didn't want anyone to know. He begged me to take the heat for it and I was young and naive and a newlywed. So, I agreed. But he was such a bastard about it. And he still never defended me when his goddamn mother... Oh, my language. So sorry, Jill. Oh, that's sweet of you, but I'm still a lady. And yes, maybe a little drunk, but... Oh, my language. No excuse. No, no, I, sh- I shouldn't have any more wine. I- Tis good, though. Oh, you're just a bad influence on me. Half a glass, then. So I went into the kitchen to throw the dishes around. Except I'd cleaned them all. So I started to clean. Deep cleaning. I started on the vegetable bin. I started taking all the veggies out and I threw them on the floor. Peppers, onions, and just threw them down. I had the ten-pound bag of potatoes in my hand and Sal came in, hollering about the racket I was making. By this time I was crying and he just launched into me, saying the meanest things he could think of. Oh, Jill, it was simply awful. But then he pushed it. Too far. I was crying at this point and sitting on the floor with my face in my hands, just taking it all in. And then he said it. The bastard. Oh, there's my language again. What's that? What did he say? Oh, Jill. He said he'd wished he'd never married me. That if he knew I would be like this, he wouldn't have. And that I should have told him about not being able to have children. Can you believe it? I must have snapped my last nerve. I stood up and I told him he was a bat. Well, you know what I called him. I reminded him of all those years ago begging me not to tell his precious mother about him being sterile. He had the nerve to call me a liar. I'd been married to him for 36 years, and I know what I know. He had chosen to side with his mother again. Even though she was dead, he was still a mama's boy. I told him I shouldn't have married him after meeting the awful thing that he called his mother, and he came at me. I was so scared. What did I do? Well, I got out of the way. His leg was bothering him, so it was just easy to avoid at first. But then, he started to catch me up. I was scared, Jill. Damn scared. And then I realised something. Sal was just hollering and swearing, and I realised I still had a ten-pound bag of potatoes in my hand. He came at me, and I let him. He was about five feet away, and I swung that bag of potatoes as hard as I could at his head. Oh, dear sweet Jesus, I did knocked him clean off his feet and sent him to the floor where he landed hard. He was still awake though and he started to swear after a few seconds. He shook his head and started after me again. I could tell he was groggy from the first hit. It looked like I'd broken his nose and he was bleeding from his forehead. I held on to the potatoes and I wound up and he stopped and he said, Don't you dare hit me again, you little mick bitch. Then he charged. Well, you know where the cellar door is, Jill? It was open because I'd been doing laundry and he charged at me. I was on the right of the door and I swung left, hit him in the same spot. I gave a little yelp. See, I'd knocked him off his course and redirected him into the cellar. Well, you know how long those stairs are going down into the basement. He fell for what seemed like a long time. When he hit the bottom, his neck made such an awful snap. Just awful. Just Who else knows? Well, it's just you, Jill. It was the wine. But you see, I didn't really kill him. He fell. Didn't push him at all. 
I was just defending myself and... No, I didn't tell the police. I figured folks would like to remember Sal as a good man. And he was a good man, most of the time. You knew how he was. Well, no. I don't think I should really go to the police, Jill Henderson. I don't know why you're so upset. Sit down and eat, Jill. Have some more mashed potatoes. What? Yes, from the same potatoes. Well, I washed them for crying out loud. I'm not going to waste them, am I? Now, hold on a minute, Jill. Just sit down. Oh, be careful, darling. You almost fell over. You've had too much to drink. No, no. You can't drive. I don't think you should go anywhere right now. Nonsense, it's okay. We're still friends, Jill. Put that phone down. Please. Let me make you some coffee. Put that goddamn phone down. Oh, dear. I'm sorry. My language. Jill. Come into the kitchen with me, Jill. And I'll fix you right up. I'll, I'll make you something. Let me just move this bag of potatoes out the way. Why, look. Looks like I still have about seven pounds of potatoes left in here. Hey, where do you think you're going? There's more stories here at the Wicked Library. Stick around or we'll turn the lights off for good. <laughs> Closing out our 2020 Halloween special, our very own Cynthia Lohman tells Checking Out by Lydia Peaver, scored by Nico Viteze of We Talk of Dreams. I eased my car into the lot reserved for the penthouse, but that felt wrong. On my way up the winding road to the abandoned hotel, it had seemed like that would be an excellent idea but I threw the car into reverse after only a moment. I swung it around sharp and double-parked in the service lot on the north side of the building where I used to so many years ago. Wanting to park in the penthouse lot had to do with not having to park right here. The first time I'd pulled into this spot, I was barely legal to drive, and the car I'd used was a death trap. Not long after, I was still as lethal more drunk, less strung out, but the car was in much better shape. It took a year before I had my feet under me again. I owed a lot to working here as a maid. Guess I hadn't really thought about it much until like a magnet, like a demanding lord, like a boot on my back. The building itself had forced me to bow somehow into parking where I ought to. Even though 20 years had passed, I was a servant, and I was to use the servant's entrance. The hotel stood on the edge of a cliff, forgotten, miles away from the next inhabitant. They'd shuttered their house for winter. I knew. I'd checked. I'd knocked and made sure. The closest town was more of a hamlet, and while I could fire a gun up here and have no one come running, there was no telling what could send someone up this way. As far as I knew, there was no watchman here, and no interest from town. It was quite a drive to get here. I wasn't the first to come, though, as the doorless opening beside the service parking proved. The defaced sign above it read, Trespassing. A faded black arrow pointed down toward that entrance, drawn in the same marker that had been used to eradicate the word, No. Instead of going in there, Pride got the best of me, and I walked around the front of the building. I wanted to see what shape the main door was in. I'd only walked in there once for my interview. Even that day, I had left through the service door. It was as if I had walked inside the hotel that first day and never left. Smashed glass hung pathetically beside the entrance, little tiny diamonds of glass interlocked looking like crumpled cellophane. The window on the opposite side had cracked but looked intact, though a mess of tangled tables and chairs was piled up against it. Looking in through the wooden arms and legs, 
I saw the rest of the lounge furniture piled up like a deadfall in front of the doors. No way over it. I could crawl under, seeing more than enough clearance, but no way was I slithering in on my belly like a snake. Light spilled down from a glowing portal overhead, so I could see the small doorman's desk, more of a podium, lit by a filthy skylight. The front desk lay behind it, sprawling to the left and right. I knew this, but could not see it. The lobby was otherwise dark as night, save the eerily lit podium. I'd known what to expect, even this weird overhead light inside. Urban exploration being what it was, hundreds of photos littered the internet. Other spectacular ruins of modern commerce drew people fascinated by rot and neglect, and this would rank as a hidden gem. I'd been the youngest staff member by five years when I started, and they had hired no one younger. Once the place retired, everyone had scattered like rats. Retire. That was a nicer word for abandon. Humans make the worst kind of mess, and cleaning up after them leaves a stain on you that no amount of bleach can lift. Perhaps the staff had all hidden afterward, soiled. Perhaps those stains had taken their toll. Perhaps I was the last left alive. Somewhere along the line, the skylight had been cleaned off. Just in the center, though. Just enough to create this unholy cathedral inside. It lit the podium like a narthex and gave a stoic, cavernous look to the guts of the hotel. Pretty for photos. If only it worked like a magnifying glass and set fire to the place. Therein lay what had sparked my visit. Someone had to clean up this mess. On the upswing, I wanted to check it out. That gave me a laugh in that bad hotel humor way. Checking out. Nowhere near as fun as gallows humor, hotel humor was, but there was a bit of blood in every room, guaranteed. On the downswing, in a black mood, I wanted to burn the damn place to the ground myself. It was a black mood day today. I headed back to the servant's entrance. This wasn't the first time that employees had used that exact phrase, burn the damn place to the ground. One owner had said it a couple times as a catchphrase and then stopped themselves when employees parroted him. I think they were likely told to stop saying that by their business partner. Reminded how important this place was. Provenance, economy, history, that sort of buzzword sandwich. Funny how the world works. I'm standing here and they're not. Overgrown, weather damaged, soaked and grieving. It's kind of amazing how quickly the place became such a terrible mess. Most of the windows smashed, furniture thrown off the roof, debris strewn in a crater, as if desolation had hit it like an asteroid. If you ask me to map out how quickly a building could fall apart, I'd not imagine this amount of damage so fast, but here it was, a ruin. Glad it was the middle of the day because I'd brought no flashlight. There was my phone, which was super bright, but hopefully I would see quite a lot without it. I hadn't decided on venturing into the basement or not. Thanks to some urbex websites, I had seen how dark and empty it was down there. Anything worth dragging up from the bowels of this infested has-been was only good for tossing out a window. That seemed to be what people liked to do here the most. I stepped into the gaping entrance. I reminded myself there was no door, so this was not breaking and entering. Trespassing, the sign had said. I imagined a warm welcome. My body wanted to turn left and continue down a wide corridor that looped behind the front desk and glanced out at the bay, where the sun reflected off beautiful waves, where the sky could be so blue it hurt. On a cloudy day with a wavy chop on the lake, it all turned gray, so the sky and water blended together, all steel and white foam. On a work day, I'd have walked there, glanced over my shoulder to the right, gotten an idea of how many people were in the dining room, then entered the narrow corridor toward the change room. That's where my soul wanted to go, 
That's where my feet pointed. But no, I wasn't a servant anymore. I stepped right and peered into the foyer. The main entrance was actually well lit by the skylight above. That odd pillar of light cut through the gloom enough so I could see all I'd come to see. Dust motes twinkling throughout the entire room as if suspended ceiling had collapsed moments ago or guests smoking cigarettes they had just snuffed out. It was humid in here. Moss spread across the floor and partway up some walls. Actual plants were taking hold near one window. The bellhop stand used to have a bell on it that I wanted to ring, but someone had stolen it naturally. The front desk was in shambles. After so many years of seeing it neat and tidy, it was heart-wrenching in the most unexpected way to see it like this. Papers littered the floor. Not one key was looped on the hooks behind, and every single mail slot was empty. Beer bottles stood on the front desk. I smiled. It was as if all the trespassers had done what those working here had always wanted to do. I expected to find defecation in the middle of floors in the penthouse. Vomit on the fine linen. Spray-painted genitalia on the ballroom floor. Velveteen wallpaper torn down in sheaves. There were some things that other people wouldn't see. Things they wouldn't look for. It's how I knew no one that had worked here had come. I knew where to look. For the scorched things. Aborted attempts to burn this place to the ground. I walked through the foyer, crumbling debris underfoot. Lighting fixtures dangled through the suspended ceiling like noose after noose. There had been a small fire started at one time, made of the memos on the front desk. The blackened edges showed where flames had bitten into damp paper, burned halfway, then given up. Looking at the debris, I could see things that looked like shotgun shells. Glancing around, it was a second before I saw the holes blasted in a flimsy interior wall. There were a lot more shell casings than I'd imagined. In photos, I'd seen a few on the stairway leading up to the living quarters. I'd seen the owner's place a handful of times and didn't need to again. I was hoping to head up the more ornate staircase that had been basically forbidden. For two hours after the last checkout, they'd allowed staff to venture up and down the stairs, normally reserved for guests. I'd not used it then, but wanted to now. Back then I was happy with the rear corridor, having usually showered and left long before guests were all settled in. It wasn't visible at first. The bay windows were boarded up tight. No view of the lake and no light on the far end of the foyer at all. The ornate and beautiful staircase had been burnt away from the bottom up to the next level. It's a wonder the rest of the building hadn't burned down with it. Anyone who had worked here would have photographed this. The staircase area was dark and would be hard to see in a photo without flash, so it made sense why no one else had. Of all the times I'd heard the phrase, burn it to the ground, these stairs were evidence of a good start. The steps were gone to the first floor, then charred wood hung impossibly from bare black joists. It looked like the moment the flames hit the second floor, the fire had lost oxygen or gotten wet. As mysterious as that was, it mattered little when the rest of the building stood. Charred remains of the first floor of stairs explained why curious people had gained access through the living quarters. No wonder there were so many photos of that area. But I knew another way. In the kitchen, the ghost of Oju and dishwater haunted my nostrils underneath rot and mossy decay. Ransacked, utensils lay strewn around, knives in the walls, now turned to a kind of concrete mache. Flour spilled across the floor from giant bins that used to be filled weekly. Quite a lot of flour was scorched dark brown. Gigantic bags of flour, potatoes, sugar, and drums of oil used to be stacked in the hall toward the industrial freezers. Beyond the walk-in fridge and staff washroom was housekeeping, linens, and laundry. Here we gathered wares for the day and headed up from there on the service elevator. Beside that was a staircase. Staff used the elevator and guests had no access to it. Apparently there had been plans to install a proper one, 
yet the building just could not accommodate it. This one was easier to install, yet out of reach. It was impossible to reconfigure the building to allow guests to use it, so bellhops would bring luggage through here to save hefting it up the curling staircase. Now the doors were sealed shut, and there was no way into the elevator shaft that reached up through the building, stopping shy of the top floor. Surprisingly, no one had pried the doors open. Maybe it looked like another freezer from down here. The buttons were old-fashioned and nondescript. Maybe you had to work here to even know what it was. The door to the stairs beside it hung open, so I couldn't have been the only one who used them. It was incredibly dark, so I used my phone light to see. Evidence of a fire lay in puddled linens on the first landing. Most hospitality linen was flame retardant, so it charred but didn't burn, even with an empty plastic bottle of lighter fluid nearby. I made my way up the narrow stairs. I'd taken the elevator every chance I had, so I'd barely noticed how stuffy the stairwell was. The air thickened with dust and decay. Knowing the place inside out, then stepping through that veil into the darkness, was jarring. This tiny shadowed set of stairs could be anywhere. It was as if I'd never come to the hotel, and for an instant, a sick sense of deja vu took over me. Finally, I breached the familiar second floor and could leave the oubliette this stairwell had become. If only I could avoid returning this way. It unsettled me somehow. The fifth floor was typically mine. The second floor was where they kept our carts. There were some smaller, single-occupancy rooms for traveling entrepreneurs and a small library cafe on this floor with a dumbwaiter to the kitchen. There used to be actual books in there, too. Sets of digests, dozens of classics, paperback westerns, and stacks of magazines. Although these were our economy suites, it had as much splendor as the rest of the building. I used to walk this hall before heading to my floor. Here were seven little rooms on one side, then the cafe area where the hall switched sides of the building, as did the remaining rooms and service area. It gave more light from the windows than a typical hotel floor. From the cafe, you could see the foyer, the front, and parking lot. Guests and staff would watch the comings and goings for hours over coffee and tea. Maybe not as spectacular as the dining room view, but with pines obscuring all else and no view of the lake, you got what you paid for. I'd trade any spot in the building for it. The floor I'd cleaned looked much like any other, so if I'd liked any floor best, this would be it. Walking past it now proved not even worth lingering over. Someone had ransacked all the chairs and, like the rest of the place, thrown them through the windows where one hung, half in and half out. There were no books to be had. They had been removed entirely. Whether that was by vandals or by the owners, I had no idea. What remained was basically a vacant room with a few destroyed wingbacks hemorrhaging their gray stuffing and the ubiquitous moss that had taken over the place. Not one book, but a pile of stuffing and broken wood jammed into an easy chair seat that had been made into a fire pit at one time. Some windows were intact here, if you counted large shards of glass hanging from their frames as intact. None were entirely busted out, but they looked even more menacing. Wind gusted, making the shards sway like dangling daggers daring to drop. Shattered glass had sprayed all over the floor, so I suppose the wind won from time to time. It was brighter up here, but not much different from downstairs. Where I wasn't stepping in mushy moss, kicking bullet casings and crumbling ceiling tiles out from under my feet, I walked on broken glass. Some room doors were open, but had little interest to me, as they were all just in various states of decay. I suppose if I hadn't looked at any photos... I would poke into more rooms and spend hours here, but I thanked the pictures I'd found online. I was saving time. I couldn't see my car from here, but I was fairly certain no one had come up. Away from the smashed glass was the mouth of the vast staircase that ran up the center of the building, grand, wooden, and mesmerizing to gaze down from the top floor. On the rest of the floors, the hallway ran through the middle, so was windowless other than where these stairs were. 
This was where most of the light upstairs would come from. I approached that section of the spiral staircase, and it wasn't as rotted out as I had feared, but sturdy. The steps creaked faintly as I walked up. About halfway up, there was a red metal glass can. I nudged it, hoping to hear the slosh of liquid. Nothing. I decided against exploring any of the rooms. These were only slightly better than economy rooms, and again, the photos online left little to the imagination. One end featured the owner's quarters. This and the floor after blended together. Featureless before and full of the same graffiti, smashed windows, and destroyed furniture now as any other forgotten place. Wanting to make the most of the sunlight filling the stairwell, I pressed on. Someone had stayed on the sixth floor more recently than the last checkout. Some beds were dragged into the hall, and it appeared squatters had spent a while here. I knew from photos that people had lived on my floor, too. That was no surprise, as the temperature was always a little warmer there, no chilly draft from the lake, and most of the windows were still intact. The fifth floor was always quiet, regardless of how busy the hotel was. Acoustics were odd once you were this high above the tree line. That's part of what kept me there. It was as if I had dragged a bit of what I liked from the library cafe to this floor and held it tight. The quiet, the warmth. There was nowhere better to relax and read a book than a random room on the fifth floor. The only better spot was on the stairwell between the fifth and sixth floor in the sun of the late afternoon. It seemed I'd never let go of that. There was a distinct lack of broken glass and shotgun shells on the floor, but still the moss, everywhere. I marveled again at how this place had stood alone for so long, open to the elements. All of this rotting, year by year. Boggy floors, fallen ceilings, damp carpet, and the musty scent of decay. Here on the sixth floor, I could see the pillar of light that cut down through the entire building like a knife. Snapping a few photos with my phone, the sunbeam seemed brighter and the foyer somehow darker, a trick of light. The beam was intense, although it wasn't that bright outside today. The stairwell behind me was lit, but not blinding like this. Even when I'd worked here, the skylight never looked this bright. It was as if it concentrated all the light in the sky like a laser through that one hole now impossible, painful to look at. I rubbed my eyes. It hadn't been that bright from below. From here it was white hot light and enough to blind me. I closed my eyes and let them adjust back to the gloom. On the eighth and final floor there were now many ways to get onto the roof. All the windows were missing. Three fires had been set at one time or another and, in the middle of one, what looked like melted plastic that could have been amenities from housekeeping carts. Some ceilings had collapsed in the rooms on the east side, and people had used furniture to climb up on the roof in the most ingenious ways. There was a service ladder on the side of the building, easy to get to, and few invaders seemed to know where it was, but I did. I strolled around the top floor a bit first, in and out of the penthouse rooms. The two rooms boasted mirrored whirlpool tubs, now filled with black muck, taps rusted and mirrors smashed. One fireplace had definitely seen more fires now than it had ever had, with char around the entire mouth of what used to be pristine white brick. Pristine white brick last time I saw it scrubbed and repainted, mind you. It rarely saw a crackling log until they abandoned the place, Penthouse types were rarely also the wood smoke types. The top floor was less wide than the rest, and no window panes made stepping out onto the wide catwalk quite safe. I walked around to the lakeside, where there was a ladder to the roof. Being made of iron as old as the foundation itself, and bolted through the girders made it sturdy as anything. Furniture from inside had found its way up here, maybe most of it. One or two items were charred black. Maybe it was because the bonfire had been so completely out of context to anyone else, they hadn't noticed it. I'd really thought someone would have tossed it all off the roof by now. One half of the skylight held years of stacked debris. 
That it had a clearing in the center made no sense to me since they'd littered the whole roof with trash. Why would someone want to light the place up? In a flash of clarity, I questioned myself. Had I done that? No telling how long it had been since I was here last, determined to burn the place to the ground. Sometimes it seemed like I'd never left. In the meantime, many people had been up here, right? Maybe cleared off the skylight somewhat. They took their photos. They had their fun. Part of me hoped someone would have finished it for me. The skylight itself was old, and the windows slanted into the center slightly, so rain and leaves did not readily tumble down off of its panes. It collected debris. Had a daring photographer cleared the spot for the perfect shot? Much of the furniture that had been tossed out a window was in a pile up here. I'd made the bonfire bit by bit, year by year. The roof was large and high enough that this tower of cabinets, dressers, chairs, and lampshades teetered unseen atop the roof, a rough effigy. I took my phone out, snapped a photo. Why no one had tried to set this on fire perplexed me, even for fun. Indeed, even with people squatting here, it seemed no one had ever set fires at all, except me. I walked as close as I could to the edge of the skylight. I couldn't quite see all the way down. The pillar of light didn't work the same from up here. It was all inky black with a misshapen bright spot at the bottom, growing more misshapen when my shadow crossed it. Set off to one side was a single cinder block. Perhaps someone had brought it up here with the same idea and had never carried through with it. Or maybe it had been up here all this time and not one person had thought to toss it through the glass. If not for the tremendous noise it would make to let nature do what it wanted, to soak, dirty, rot, and destroy the building, nature would one day claw back every mineral this place was made of, just not fast enough for me. I tilted the rough stone up with both hands and heard the clink as something toppled out onto the roof. A plastic lighter just where I'd left it. After trying in vain to set fire to the front desk, I'd naturally moved up, floor by floor. If only the books had all been where they ought to be, my job would have been a little easier. Damn them. The staircase fire wouldn't stay lit. The linens wouldn't burn. The damn wood and the damn hearth wouldn't burn. Doused the place with gas and it sputtered out as if it were rainwater. This was the last time I would try. Flicking the lighter, I watched the flame dance in a gust of wind. All of those bloodied beds, permanently soiled carpets, over bleached bathroom tiles, greasy curtains with filth. Worst of all, the thankless and selfish people who had stayed here. Greedy owners, wretched staff. None were worse than the guests. While all of that was gone, this tomb of memory still stood, a mocking, pathetic reminder. With it gone, would the memory fade? I was certain. This was the one way to truly clean this, to get it off of me, to purify it all. I lit the dry papers scrunched into the bottom of the pile, Holding flame to the napkins from the dining room, they caught and burned. Soon, the grease and plastics inside would catch like napalm. The furniture offered a mix of hardwood and composite, offering various burn times and chemical stinks. And smoke. The smoke would be immense. That was why I'd always tried to start a fire from the inside, from the first floor. Maybe it would buy me time to drive far enough away. It wouldn't let me, though. Not inside, but out here in the fresh air, fire was finally taking. I wasn't that superstitious to say the place was sentient and stopping me from raising it to the ground. Be it the dampness, the wind, the green growth, it just didn't want to burn. Watching the blaze spread was relaxing in the way flames can be. The tension release of fuel, heat, and air matched my years of servitude slowly falling away from coal to ember to ash 
Once the fire stoked, I lifted the block over my head. I walked again to the edge of the skylight. Would it make its way through what was left of the protective gate across the center? Or would it hold, I wondered. What I really ought to do is walk out to the center and drop it from this height, but that wasn't very safe. I lowered the brick and held it like a kettlebell. With my legs splayed in a powerful stance to make sure that I wouldn't lose my footing, I swung back and forth three times to gain momentum before letting the brick go sailing through the air toward the center of the skylight. Brick punched through glass. A thunderous noise as the skylight shattered. It hung on for a second, then all fell straight down below, taking my crackling fire with it. Sparks and flame followed like comet tails as debris crashed down to the foyer below. Some furniture went out as it sailed through the air. Some hit the floor on fire at 60 miles an hour. The bags of flour from the kitchen I had added to the pile exploded on impact, sending dust up into the air. A massive Molotov cocktail of flame burst up the shaft of light. Each grain of flour ignited instantly in the quiet and deadly explosion of this rotting hotel's heart. Rumbling under my feet caught me off guard, and I steadied myself as best I could. I tried to stand more upright, but couldn't gain my footing, then realized one of my legs was losing ground entirely. The rotten roof was giving way. One foot sank into the mossy and granular shingles. My hands scrambled, and I backpedaled to gain footing. I could feel the roof buckling under me and panicked, tumbled onto my back, and knew it was only a moment before I fell through. The smell of rotten wood and debris hit me fresh as sodden wood broke. My back sank into the suddenly soft roof, so I flipped over, desperately trying to grab onto whatever I could. Scrabbling nails gripped nothing as my hand grated on the disintegrating roof tiles. I pulled myself up. There was some relief as I stood and steadied myself. I brushed off slimy wood rot and asphalt bits, but in an instant the roof gave out under my feet. I fell one second before screaming. By the time the scream left my throat, I'd flung my arms out but realized there was nothing I could do. My next reaction was to expect impact. Now. Rotten wood smoke woke me, and chasing that immediately was the pain. I'd broken some ribs easily. One arm for certain, a leg or my hip, it was hard to tell. Dragging myself through the blinding pain and choking smoke, I couldn't think beyond crawling. Crawl through the broken glass. Crawl through the muck the bog that the hotel was, crawl through wetness that could be my blood. I could feel heat and hear fire. I could see the flickering light all around me. Crawl under the smoke. Crawl toward the light. In this blur of darkness, red and bright white light, if I could make an effort here, the odds might tip in my favor. Smoke and flames might bring someone to my rescue if I could make it to the door. One wretched thought stopped me. Which door was I heading toward? Light, air, safety. My instincts cried out for them. My pride stopped me cold. Was I heading to the service door or the front? The widest light was to my left and surely the main entrance. I clawed at the ground to steer my body toward it. You would think it shouldn't matter given the situation. But it did. It mattered to me. Hello, kiddies. So, you want access to the Wicked Archives, do you? Well, it takes money to keep the lights on and keep our beasties fed. Trust me, you don't want them hungry. They might just start eating the writers, and then where would we be? Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash wicked library and pledge your support to the show. For $2 a month, I'll give you a key to our collection of classic episodes. For $5 a month, I'll let you hear the bonus stories before the rest of our listeners. Even more tantalizing rewards await. 
for those who want to sacrifice more to us. <laughs> Over 70 classic episodes are lurking deep in the private area of the library, just waiting to be heard by you. Pledge yourself to the library today, and you'll be ours forever. You're going to like it here, I think. <laughs> How much is it for people to enjoy the private area of the librarian, Dan? <laughs> when I was 17, I killed my best friend and burned down an abandoned old mansion in the woods. Then I had to live the rest of my life. She moved to Gun Cotton, West Virginia, with the hope that she might finally be able to face the demons she'd been running from her whole life. I think if I went back home, maybe I could start writing again. Little does she know, they've been waiting for her all along. You know you can't ever leave me. You don't even want to. We all have to make traits in life. This for that. But tell me, do you know what is really important to you? Are you feeling well? WSF Productions invites you to brave the foggy streets of Gun Cotton, West Virginia. The nightmare haze of dream and delusion and the mists of time itself in this, the fifth season of the West Side Fairy Tales. Scars in Time. A 20-episode sonically-driven horror narration written, directed, and produced by Tyler Bell. Available wherever you get your podcasts. Learn more at westsidefairytales.com.